Did you know over 15,000 murders are going to be committed in America this year? That's 43 a day. Some are crimes of passion or a result of criminal activity. About two thirds can be explained because police catch the killer. But 11 people today, like literally today, are going to be murdered by another person and their killer will almost never be caught. Now, why do I know this and why am I telling you? It's because in 1990, my older sister Grace was murdered and her killer has never been caught. And here is our story. Before I go into my sister's case, let me give you a little background. I'm one of nine kids, eight in the lineup. <laughs> That's a pretty big family. Grace was 11 years older than me. With Grace, my mom had a very difficult delivery. You see, my sister was born with a brain injury. As a result, my sister was born with a lot of behavioral and mental problems, to the extent where she had to be you know, admitted to hospitals for really long periods of time. I mean, like, I hardly ever saw my sister growing up. I only saw her occasionally on the weekends and holidays. Thanksgiving, 1990, you know the drill. Food, football, more food, right? It's like the greatest holiday for me, or it used to be. My parents were going to Florida the very next day. We had the greatest holiday. I never thought in a million years the next time I saw my sister Grace would be at the Boston City Mall. On November 25th, 1990, the Boston Police 911 Center received a call uh, reporting a dead body in a building on uh, Yeoman Street near Ziegler in the Roxbury section of Boston. Uh, officers responded at 6.30 in the morning to that call, met a man on the front sidewalk who had been walking by, uh, looked in the window and thought he saw a body. The officers made an immediate entry and they found the body of a 35-year-old female uh, laying on the, uh, f on the floor. Um, she was covered in clothing. Uh, she had a ligature around her neck, and she was dead. The victim, uh, later identified as Grace McDonald, um, died of asphyxiation. The autopsy was able to prove that. The case was investigated uh, for, for uh, a period of months, and uh, ultimately the case and the uh, the trail went cold. I remember calling the police, looking for updates, like anything. I just couldn't wrap my head around it and I wanted some answers, but there were no answers. The first five years, I just tried to stuff all the feelings about my sister's murder way down deep. But you know what? I just couldn't shake it. Knowing that my sister's murder was out there walking around made me angry and it got worse over time. I mean, like 15 years went by. Imagine trying to just stuff 15 years worth of feelings down like that. You know, and they started to come out in all sorts of different ways, right? That just wasn't working for me. So what I started to do was I, I, I prayed. I, I prayed for the family and I prayed for the person who murdered my sister. And I, and I basically forgave him for myself because I couldn't carry around that rotted piece of soul any longer. I just needed to forgive and move on. Even though I was starting to feel better, I still wasn't capable of putting it all together to express how my sister's murder makes me feel. And, you know, to be honest with you, this is like one of the first times I've been able to put it all together for this project. You know, things like music, movies, television shows that focus on violent crime are triggers for me. And the news, forget about it. It seems like there's always a new story about a grisly murder or disappearance stuffed between the, the, the weather and the traffic. And you know, it's not until a major event happens that make us all stop and think. The first time I met Tommy McDonald was at a uh, birthday celebration for his uh, wife's grandfather. We became fast friends actually, and Tom invited me to his shop and, and allowed me to work with him on a bunch of uh, different uh, woodworking projects. And, and after, uh, after getting to know him and, and going to the shop, um, he told me one day that his sister had been murdered. Um, I had no idea that it happened, and um, uh, we got to talk about it, and the crime had happened in Boston. Right around 2009, the Justice Department, through their research arm, the National Institute of Justice, 
uh, released grant funding uh, for cold case homicide DNA testing. So after the grant came through um, and I, I had a chance to speak to the detectives, uh, it was ironic that uh, Tommy's uh, sister, uh, her case had been chosen as one of the cold cases. And uh, I was able to connect Tommy with the homicide investigators, and they were able to report out on the DNA that they were able to find. It blew me away sitting with the cold case detectives 25 years later. To be honest with you, they're the heroes in my book. But it was weird for me 25 years later to drive into the city of Boston and sit in an interrogation room with these detectives and learn the latest facts about my sister's case. You know, for 25 years, I held on to the fact that my sister wasn't sexually assaulted. And then they told me that my sister had been sexually assaulted. I held on to that news for about two and a half years by myself because I just felt like, why tell my siblings if I just didn't have the next piece of the puzzle? And I gotta tell you, the toughest thing about that news was telling my sisters that their sister had been sexually assaulted. <laughs> It just hurts a little bit. One day I went to Tommy's shop and he was in a terrible mood. Uh, I couldn't even make sense of what he was talking about, but I guess someone from the Herald had interviewed him for an article about cold case murders in Boston. And he had just read the article and they had painted the police in a bad light and he was really upset about the way they presented the information in the article. And I was so confused, I, was, I didn't understand what they would be interviewing him for about cold cases. And that was the day that, that I learned about Grace. Over the years, I became really close with Tommy's dad. One day, I was sitting with him in his den, and he pointed to something on his shelf, and he asked me to go and get it. It was a picture of the whole family. And I handed it to him. And he pointed to Grace's face and he said, that was my oldest Grace. And this was the first I'd ever heard him talk about her. And he said that Grace had so many problems and they didn't know what to do with her. That they couldn't take care of her themselves and with nine kids, they didn't know what to do. And, and he said that that was his baby. She was his baby. And somebody killed her. And he couldn't protect her. My heart broke that day. I sat there on the floor in front of him, holding his hands. And he cried, and I cried. And it was just heartbreaking. I had never witnessed the profound grief and horror that accompanies the loss of a loved one to such a violent crime as murder. I never got to meet my sister-in-law, Grace. <sighs> but I love her. You know, I only have two regrets in my life. One is that I never got a chance to know my sister Grace. I couldn't tell you her favorite song or food or movie. I just couldn't tell you anything about her because I just never got a chance to know her. I never even got a chance to tell my sister that I loved her. And that right there really eats me up. The second thing is, is that I've never done anything, well, up till now, about my sister's murder to keep her memory alive. That's why this project right here is so important to me. Because this project isn't just for me, this project is dedicated to my big sister, Grace. <laughs>